You are not going to believe some of the craziness that Abby Sharp is now getting up to. Roll the titles. For the record, I'm done trying to make y'all comfortable. For the record, you ain't trying to grow them stuff. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. As always, just a quick reminder that I'm now offering the SIBO organic acids, stool tests and consult via my website. So if you have any health or digestive problems, then consider taking these tests as they will provide a lot of very detailed information upon which you can start making informed decisions and then start getting your health back on track. And on that bombshell, to the video. Now, as I mentioned in my last video in the series, the do's and don'ts of the SIBO diet is where things get a little murky. I don't think it's very murky. The vast majority of people can fix SIBO on a variety of different diet types. The food is not the issue, it's the bacteria in the gut that's the issue. And as long as you deal with this correctly, many people are able to maintain their existing diets without having to modify them, which is always preferential. Now, if you believe the internet hysteria, then you are often recommended to go low FODMAP because the flawed theory is that you will help starve off the bacteria while you are treating the condition. A high proportion of the people that I see for SIBO are plant-based and they tend to eat a lot of carbs. Very few of these have had to go on a restricted FODMAP diet to eliminate their SIBO. And to be honest, I see a greater relapse rate for people who go low FODMAP FODMAP or very low carb diet when treating their SIBO. So if you have SIBO, then don't believe the hype and hysteria and continue to eat a balanced diet. Obviously avoid processed refined foods and sugars, etc. And if you notice that any particular foods are causing you issues, then just try and reduce the amount that you are eating them. Try not to eliminate them completely as this may cause additional problems further down the line. And we will discuss this shortly. Everyone and their grandma has a different professional opinion. <laughs> most of which makes sense physiologically or theoretically, but there isn't a ton of quality research in this area of practice yet. So a lot of this is really based on like trial and error or clinical evidence. Agreed, but unfortunately, many people are recommending and suggesting very restricted diets that are not based on scientific consensus or even clinical experience. Now, the diet suggestion that there's probably the most consensus on is to focus on meal spacing. So the recommendation is often three large meals with a solid four to five hours in between, and ideally like a 12 hour fast overnight to help promote the migratory motor complex. Where is the scientific consensus, Abby? I would like to read this. Surely if what you were saying is correct, then the recommendations would be to eat one or two meals per day and then intermittently fast. But again, we're getting off the topic here. The vast majority of people are able to beat SIBO without having such restrictive or prescriptive eating patterns. So very quickly, the migratory motor complex is like a big sweeping broom that kind of moves food along the digestive tract every 90 to 130 minutes or so. So everything we put, anything with calories into our mouth, it halts the migratory motor complex and it's forced to kind of reboot and start the process all over again. Correct, but coming back to my point just a minute ago, if this was such a problem, then the recommendations would be to eat less frequently and also supplement or medicate to support the MMC. Again, these are buzzwords and hypotheses that the vast majority of people will really not need to factor into their treatment. And if we aren't allowing this MMC to occur in full, theoretically, bacteria can more easily pool and flourish. I will tell you how absurd Abby's comments are here. You just heard her say that the MMC help stop bacteria pooling and flourishing. How so? You have trillions of bacteria pooled in the colon, i.e. your microbiome. So surely if the MMC is there to prevent pooling of bacteria, then people wouldn't have microbiomes in their colons. Oh, I forgot the MMC is magical and it only stops bacteria pooling in certain parts of the gut. And obviously it can also decide who stays and who goes. Again, I urge people not to get caught in the weeds with these types of discussions, because usually when people are trying to convince you about the importance of the MMC and these other types of buzzwords, then they are trying to sell you supplements or potions. It's often theorized that constantly disrupting the MMC can potentially contribute to conditions that cause SIBO. And yeah, like if I'm honest, I'm a mom. I am always putting tiny little bits of things into my mouth. No. 
comment. You know, whether I'm trying to model eating broccoli for my kids or like testing the temperature or something for my baby or tasting a smoothie before I give it to them to make sure it tastes good or just like eating scraps off of their plate. This is probably such a common motherhood experience. It's fairly difficult to comment here because I don't have children and I can only guess how difficult it is as a parent spinning all of those different plates. What I will say is that I don't believe for one second that scraps of food throughout the day are going to have any significant bearing on the MMC and getting rid of SIBO. Humans are great apes and from that line of bonobos and orangutans etc we have and will always be grazers. So again don't get lost in the weeds like Abby is doing here. For some reason people love to overcomplicate these types of problems. So I don't feel bad about this. But then it's also believed that people with SIBO have a deficient MMC due to like nerve damage in the gut. Yeah, like it's kind of a chicken egg situation, but also grazing likely exacerbates the SIBO problem. Again, there is no credible evidence anywhere to support this claim. Anyway, for this reason, folks with SIBO likely need kind of that longer spacing between meals to just optimize digestion and nutrient absorption. So for me, that means I'm going to try to aim for like 8.30 a.m. breakfast, ish, one-ish lunch, 5.30ish dinner, because that's when we have dinner as a family, 8.30 snack, which I know is not quite four hours, but I need to eat a snack before bed in order to not wake up in the night hungry. So this is just like the best I can do, especially because I'm just trying to juggle my kids' schedules and my husband's schedules and activity and school and meals and all that. So I'm not going to stress over little details. This still has to fit into my actual real life. For someone who believes in intuitive eating, Abby, this is fairly rigid and prescriptive, particularly when there is no sound basis for it. Graze throughout the day or eat larger meals intermittently. Whatever approach you take, you can deal with SIBO. So I'm doing the best that I can without going crazy. Now, unfortunately, that's where the consensus on the SIBO diet kind of stops. There is no consensus here whatsoever. I've done literature reviews and read the most credible SIBO evidence that exists and there is absolutely no consensus on spreading meals throughout the day because of negative impacts on the MMC. I would say that almost every other diet suggestion beyond this is inconsistent as f but they all center around this concept of limiting the food sources and the fuel of the bacteria to hopefully prevent reoccurrence. Unfortunately though, Abby, you can't just starve the bacteria in the small intestines without starving the bacteria in the colon. And these bacteria are super important for regulating bowel movements and also gut motility. So let's say you go on a restrictive fiber diet and starve the bacteria in the small intestines and also your colon. What do you think will happen when you reintroduce these foods and you have a low level of bacteria in the colon to be able to ferment the fiber? Just maybe an impact on your gut motility and maybe a migration of bacteria from the colon into the small intestines when you start becoming constipated. Now, there are a lot of different recommended protocols, each with little to no direct evidence to support their use. Exactly, so don't recommend them to people as a first step. But the main ones and their associated sets of rules include one, the specific carbohydrate diet, which largely has you cut out like a variety of sugars, dairy, grains, and legumes. We've got the gut and psychology syndrome diet, aka GAPS diet, which eliminates all grains, dairy, starchy vegetables, and refined carbs. We've got the low FODMAP diet, which I actually have done previously, but basically you're to limit sources of FODMAPs based on your unique triggers to them. Um, we've got the SIBO specific food guide, which is kind of a combination of the specific carbohydrate diet and the low FODMAP diet. These all sound so much fun, hey? Restriction after restriction, and as Abby has said, based on no sound evidence. We've got the SIBO biphasic diet, which mainly is about reducing fermentable starches and fibers. We've got the Cedar sinai diet, which focuses mainly on meal timing, but also suggests avoiding sugar alcohols, sucralose, and limiting sources of lactose and fructose. The fast track diet for IBS, which gives foods a fermentation potential based on the glycemic index of the food and some other nutrition facts. And occasionally we see some people recommend some form of like the paleo diet, where you're basically avoiding foods that are ancestral apparently didn't have access to. Or you could just eat a normal balanced healthy diet and concentrate on fixing the issues in the gut 
rather than modifying the diet to control some level of symptomatology. Honestly, that one's total BS. Now, if you feel overwhelmed, know that I do too. And what is even more frustrating is that there is not a single published paper on the benefits of any of these diets. No more questions, Your Honor, but I will tell you where a lot of this originates from. Alison C. Becker and Mark Pimentel, who are the godfathers of the SIBO movement, are advocates of the paleo diet, and they have been fairly outspoken about how damaging carbohydrates can be in the body. Unfortunately, because of this, it's been perpetuated for many years, and now apparently you can't fix SIBO while eating carbohydrates. But just remember, there is no scientific basis to any of this whatsoever, so don't get sucked into these type of restrictive diets. For treating SIBO. None, nada. Now, that's not to say that these diets won't or don't help with SIBO. I mean, a lot of them probably do at least help with symptom management by reducing the fermentable foods, aka the fuel, for the bacteria. Yes, you can modify your diet to control symptoms, but you will likely pay for it longer term when you try and reintroduce carbohydrates and fibers back into the diet. But we don't have actual trials to prove it, which you guys know I don't love. I actually don't love restricting my diet, period. And because I personally feel so overwhelmed by all the conflicting recommendations, I'm probably just going to take a more intuitive approach and change what like, I feel like I can change without causing myself too much stress. A Men. So for me, I think that's going to mean one, I'm going to probably try to avoid things with like Splenda, aka sucralose in it, since Splenda is not like a food I love. It's not a food that I feed my family. It's only in some supplements, which I can easily swap out. I bet the bacteria are quaking in their little boots. So I'm going to switch out my protein powder, which currently contains some Splenda for something that's stevia based, since it does seem like one thing most of these diets agree on is that stevia is the most SIBO-friendly sweetener. Looks like another person who was worried about protein deficiency in the Western world. Abby talks routinely about her intuitive balanced diet to get all of her nutrients, then necks down supplements and protein powers because she is fearful that her diet is lacking. Absolutely genius. Splenda seems to be like one of the more problematic ones. And then other sugars like maple syrup and honey are questionable depending on which diet list you review. These are all simple sugars, Abby, which will very likely be absorbed very high up in the small intestines before they hit the SIBO infection in many people. So again, the topic is being overcomplicated here. So this to me is a pretty easy swap. I'm not giving up anything that I love. Second, I'm also going to continue to limit some of those triggering FODMAPs as I've really already been doing because this is just what feels best to my body anyway. And it may theoretically also help with the SIBO. So for me, that means limited lactose, limited cruciferous vegetables, limited legumes, and very limited sugar alcohol. Restriction, restriction, and more restriction. Sounds like a whole lot of fun for something that has no sound basis. I'm not going to obsess over it. Like I'm not reading every single label incessantly. And if I go out, I'm probably gonna eat those things. Not gonna lie. But I'm going to focus my meal planning on other foods that I really like. Not obsessing, yet makes a 20 minute video about restricting foods out of her diet based on hearsay. And then finally, I'm largely going to focus my energy on what I can add, not take away. I'm going to try to have two kiwis daily, which actually has evidence to support its use for bloating and IBS-like symptoms. And I also love kiwis. And then I'm going to focus mainly on the supplements that I'm going to add to my life. Ah, yes. The kiwi and supplement SIBO approach. It's the new Kibo diet. Now, without evidence, I wouldn't even know which one of these diets to adhere to. So there's really no point in my mind of me like arbitrarily following any of them to a T and then making myself miserable doing so in the process. Amen to that. This has to be realistic and sustainable. Sustainable? How long are you planning on having SIBO, Abby? Okay. And speaking of There's a lot, I'm not gonna lie, but here's where I'm netting out based on the suggestions from my two dietitian colleagues. 
Oh yeah, Abby, you just need these 30 supplements a day as they are essential for fixing SIBO. And that will be just $500 a month. Thank you, please. And no, I am not sponsored by any of these or married to any of these brands. Actually, in a lot of cases, it was very hard for me to get anything like these here in Canada. Like the states have a lot more options. So I certainly didn't have the luxury to be comparing options or comparing brands. It just, I got what I got. Sound basis for taking them. Hey, no idea on the quality, but what the hell does that matter? So here is my supplement bin. And that's a lot. I also had to create like a little schedule for myself because otherwise it was just gonna be like too much work throughout the day to just like combine. Oh my God, these ones, oh, okay. And then I'm putting them into these little cute containers. Hilarious, isn't it? Abby is so worried about the MMC, but not thought for one minute the impact that throwing all of these different supplements down her neck will have in this area. To just simplify my life so that I doesn't take up my whole day just trying to find the right supplement in the bin. It is a total mess, but so is the rest of my life. So here we are. All right, let's try to find what I wanna find here. Okay, so very quickly, got the Biofilm Disruptor Bismuthiol Complex, which I mentioned I'm taking for a few months before even starting the antibiotic treatment. This helps to penetrate the biofilm and make it easier to target the bacteria living inside. This is nothing more than marketing hype. Even if biofilms were a problem in SIBO, you could just take a broad spectrum digestive enzyme and this would help degrade biofilm layers at a fraction of the cost. This is sun fiber. This is partially hydrolyzed guar gum. Really great for basically digestion, for moving things along, for motility, constipation. So important when it comes to managing SIBO symptoms. And if you can't handle psyllium, because I love psyllium fiber too, but if it's too mm, gummy for you, I find find that um, partially hydrolyzed guar gum or sun fiber is a lot clearer, less gritty, less kind of gelatinous. Just eat a balanced and varied diet and you will get all of the fiber that you need and you will save yourself 10 to 20 pounds in the process. Next, we've got bovine colostrum. I know that's gross <laughs> as a breastfeeding mama. Mm, nope. But the thinking is that the immunoglobulins in colostrum may help to strengthen the mucosal integrity against bacteria relevant in SIBO. And this is somebody that is apparently evidence-based. It sounds, Abby, like you don't have the faintest idea what you are doing and you are just taking everything that you can find on the internet. So that's why I'm taking that one. I've also got this full spectrum binder. It's called GI De Detox, which is a gross name, as you know. But basically the binder helps to pull out the die off remnants from the bacterial overgrowth once you're going through the antibiotic protocol. What's that? Maybe another $40? So here we've got Alimax Pro. This is an herbal antimicrobial, which basically acts as an adjunct to the antibiotics in killing off bacteria. It does ugh, taste like garlic and I dislike it greatly. But anyways, I took it last time too. So this is back in rotation. This is one that is actually fairly useful for some people, but only if you have low levels of bacteria in your small intestines. Okay, here we've got ox bile, which I know also gross sounding, but basically low bile flow is one of the purported causes of SIBO since bile is antimicrobial and helps to emulsify fats. So adding bile to the diet theoretically may help support this process. But again, like, Everything else, we don't actually have actual evidence of that. Abby, I hear that butt crack hair is very good for SIBO. Fancy some of that. Next, we've got digestive enzymes. And I want to flag here that if you have a healthy working gut, you do not need digestive enzymes. Hard stop. Do not let an influencer say that you do. It's just that the excess bacteria in SIBO often damages the digestive enzymes, making it harder for you to break down food. Yes, digestive enzymes can be very useful for many. For most people who are dealing with SIBO, I often recommend that they take a digestive enzyme. So again, theoretically, it may make sense to add back digestive enzymes, but we don't actually have evidence to <laughs> support that. So again, not something I'm recommending to the masses. This is Iberogast. Love Iberogast. So basically it's an herbal tincture of peppermint, chamomile, licorice root, lemon balm, and a few others. But we actually have evidence to support its use for IBS and functional dyspepsia. So yeah, I personally find this one to be quite helpful for me to have with meals, especially during the whole SIBO healing journey. Yes, for some people with bowel movement issues and constipation, then Iberogast can offer a crutch for gut motility while you are dealing with the bacteria. You really don't want to 
become over-reliant on the stuff, and overuse has been known to cause some longer-term gut issues in some. Okay, so we've got S. Boulardi probiotic. So the question of whether or not to take a probiotic supplement is debatable in SIBO groups, but most experts agree that if you're going to take a probiotic, Saccharomyces boulardi, S. Boulardi, is one of your best bets. Maybe after you've removed the SIBO, but not so much when you have a gut full of bacteria. So this has been studied with antibiotics in the treatment of SIBO and it's had really favorable results both with and on its own even without the antibiotics. It also appears to enhance nutrient absorption and it isn't affected by antibiotics so it is safe to take during the treatment. So we love that. Just going to need to remortgage for that little lot, hey Abby, and that's before you've even started your treatment. Okay, another probiotic I'm taking is called orthospore. So you will often see people talk about spore-based bacillus coagulant strains of probiotics, which are often seen as, again, one of the best probiotics for SIBO. Now, we definitely need more research in this area, but one small study did find a significant decrease in SIBO symptoms and positive SIBO tests. Yeah, adding that to the mix may help to kind of like re-inoculate the gut once we're wiping everything out with the drugs. So why are you taking it before the antibiotics if the study that you're citing says to try taking it while taking the antibiotic and as a therapy after you finish the antibiotic? Okay, then we've got magnesium citrate, aka magnesium calm. So this is a really common over-the-counter supplement for constipation that really helps to draw water into the intestines to stimulate the bowels. So when treating SIBO, especially methanogenic bacteria, we really need to focus on working those bowels so any little additions like magnesium citrate can definitely help especially because that neomycin can do some wonky things to digestion and motility so yes adding this to the rotation can definitely help but wasn't that why you were taking the iberogast abby and what happens when you throw all of these different supplements into your guts on a daily basis Oh, that's right, you don't have a clue. Okay, and then I've got peppermint capsules. This one is really as like an as-needed basis. So it does have research to support its use for IBS, especially things like bloating and digestion, gas. For those days that I'm really feeling the effects of those antibiotics, these may come in handy for me. The Iberogast also contains peppermint, but I guess we're going with the approach that a little of something must be good, therefore a lot must be so much better. Also, Ginger, finally, again, I'm mainly gonna be taking this on like an as needed basis to just help manage any nausea symptoms that I might get from the drugs. But ginger also has some prokinetic properties. Some research has actually shown that it can help with motility. And I actually took ginger supplements after antibiotic treatment in my last go. So I am gonna keep this in rotation this time as well. That one is indeed true. For some people, it acts as a really good prokinetic agent in the gut to get the bowels moving. That is what I'm gonna be focusing on. I mean, there are so many options recommended for SIBO. Like it's, it is not like this is an exhaustive list, believe it or not, or a one size fits all model. And let's just speak about the elephant in the room here. None of this little lot is actually getting rid of the bacteria. And very few of these supplements have any sound evidence to support their use. And I don't even know for sure that any or all of these things are going to help. Everyone's needs are going to be so different. So please speak to a registered dietitian. Do not even attempt to copy this without speaking to a healthcare provider. I cannot even attest to whether or not all of these things or any of these things are going to necessarily help, um, but I'm leaning on the experts here. I'm leaning on my colleagues who see SIBO patients day in, day out to help guide me to make the best decisions here. And really, I'm just trying to give this my absolute best shot because yeah, this might be the last and only time I'm able to do the neomycin pharmaceutical drugs. If these are recommendations from professionals who treat SIBO on a daily basis, then you need to run a mile because often they will be making a fortune while selling you these supplements. Now, finally, there are a few additional lifestyle suggestions that I want to incorporate into my life that may help to support my treatment, but also just be kind of good for me in life in general. 
So one of those is to engage in activities to stimulate the vagus nerve, which is one of the main components of the parasympathetic nervous system, which oversees pretty much everything from your digestion to your mood to your immune response via the brain gut axis. So we do have evidence that vagus nerve stimulation can serve as a promising add-on treatment for IBS, and you don't have to pay for any kind of like fancy therapy to stimulate it. So singing, humming, laughing, deep breathing, and gargling with water a few times a day are all effective strategies for stimulating the vagus nerve. So you just mean what people do already. That is all stuff that I can incorporate into my routine easily enough, especially since I sing pretty much everything I say as a mom. <laughs> so this is really business as usual as far as I'm concerned. And then of course, there's also trying to get in some gentle movement, trying to manage sleep and stress, which probably, I don't know, deserves like a whole Whole other video to unpack. But I will just say that I have started new medication for my sleep, which is definitely helping me sort through that. But again, that's like a whole other video. So I'll get to that another time. No, I absolutely agree with those statements around sleep and stress. I do, however, wonder what interactions all of these medications and supplements are going to have in Abby's system. But this is just my plan, it's a lot, I know. The keyword, mine, my, 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 mine. Not yours, not yours, not yours, not yours, not yours. And for the freaking millionth time, do not attempt to copy this without individualized care from a registered dietitian that specializes in digestive support. So again, I'm leaving some links to my colleagues below. Investing in all of this without a whole lot of research to support it is, again, not how I like to roll. This is not my style. It's not what I recommend. But ultimately, we got to work with what we got here. And I really don't have a whole lot of options. How about not spending all of this money on unnecessary supplements for three months and concentrate on removing the bacteria in the gut and then rebuilding and repopulating the gut? But hey, that may be a little bit too much like common sense. Anyhow, that's the end of today's video. If you enjoyed this one, then be sure to check out this one up here because I'm sure you'll find it equally interesting. And the only other thing that's left for me to say is to remember to look after your body because it's the only place you have to live. And I'll see you next time.